Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. Uh, a number of people have asked me, what is .NET? What is C Sharp? What is the .NET ecosystem? And can I explain it because it seems confusing? I've got a couple of interesting tweets here from some new friends. This gentleman is saying, I know nothing about C Sharp, but there's lots of programmers who like it. Um, he says, is it an ecosystem? Is it a product? Is it part of Windows? Is it part of Azure? Um, you know, why do people use it? Do they like the tooling? Kelsey Hightower says he thought it was a programming language, but then discovered that he feels it was a mini operating system. with Lots of different execution environments and programming languages. So I did the best I could to explain it in a tweet, and I'm going to take this tweet and I'm going to explain a little bit of that to you today in a short video to give you a sense of what is .NET. Okay? It's not the best name, but it's the name that we have. So .NET is a platform for building stuff. That means it's a runtime, a series of languages, and a bunch of libraries that can enable you to build basically any app because there are runtimes or environments basically anywhere. So whether that be a desktop app or a web app or something on a mobile device, an Android or a watch, Raspberry Pi, Unity, which you play a lot of games with, use a C Sharp at its heart, and do all these different things. You know, and people like it, blah, 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 marketing, marketing. Uh, the confusing part was that there were a bunch of different ways to run .NET for a while. The .NET framework is the one that you probably have heard of, it runs on Windows. .NET Core is new and open source. And then Mono or Xamarin is a, oh, uh, is a basically an open source re-implementation or a clean room re-implementation of .NET that ran originally on Linux. That's all being combined into one single SDK, Software Development Kit, with one base class library, BCL. One of the things that's cool about .NET is that there's a bunch of libraries. You don't necessarily have to go looking for a library just because you want to left pad a string. So there'll be all kinds of cool features with cross-platform UIs and native this and that, and it'll be lovely. Uh, .NET has been out for many years, and currently, in uh, the year of our Lord 2020, we have a long-term support, three years of support version of .NET Core. It's open source all the way down to the metal, and it runs on Windows and Mac and Ubuntu and all the different Linuxes and Docker. It runs everywhere. You can make anything you want with it. Later this year, in 2020, .NET 5 will come out, and then we'll just bounce every other year with a new long-term support uh, addition. So .NET is a thing, and then it says, hey, go use it today. Now, what does that even mean? Well, if we go up at the website, we see that we can go and download .NET. This is the Windows one. This one is basically done. You want to spend your time with .NET Core because it runs anywhere. You can go and download the SDK for Linux or Mac or whatever makes you happy. And again, SDK is Software Development Kit. We have a little table here. And it just basically says you can use this one and you'll be supported for a long time. And we actually put the date of when it'll be supported till, and then .NET 5 is currently in preview. So we're pretty clear about the one that you might want to get. Let's look back here. So .NET is a weird name, a weird top-level domain that is the ecosystem. That means languages, runtimes, and libraries, and then all the different things around it. So languages like C Sharp and F Sharp and VB and others. There are lots of languages. These are your main ones. Runtimes are places that you can run these languages. We have a common language runtime, and that lets you run all these things. And that core CLR runs all over. It's nice, clean, open source code. You can compile it for PlayStation for all I care. And then you've got libraries. There's a lot of base class libraries, a lot of functions and stuff that you can get that are built in. Thousands of them. That's why one of the main things that people like about .NET is that it has a ton of functions built in, and you just bring them in by bringing in namespaces. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then there's all the great third-party and OSS libraries that there's millions and millions of, and you can go check those out. Okay, so if .NET is an ecosystem of stuff comprising languages and runtimes and libraries, so the CLR is kind of like the JVM, if we put this in Java terms. And NuGet are basically packages. You bring those libraries in 
those third-party libraries, those open source libraries via our thing called NuGet. That's like the Node Package Manager or Maven on Java. We have a command line interface that we'll show you called .NET. And then you can do stuff, .NET new, .NET run, .NET build, .NET publish, and things like that. That's your main entry point. That's your thing that you talk to .NET with. You do Java C or Go or uh, whatever, Node. That's the thing that you do. So if I come out here to the command line and I go super fancy and I just make a directory, I'm just on Windows, and I have an empty folder here, and I say .NET new, there's a list of stuff I can make. These are all things you can make. Now, this is a little different because oftentimes with Node or Go or Rust, it's like, here's Hello World. These are templates. These are starter packs. If I said .NET new console, it'll set me up. It'll set up my folder with the things that I want. But I can make Windows Presentation Foundation apps. I can do unit tests. I can do uh, razor pages for making websites. And I can do model view controller like uh, Ruby on Rails, but .NET. I can do React, gRPC. This list here are just templates. At its root, though, it's using the .NET runtime. And then if it's a web application, we add on top of that ASP.NET, which is the web part of things. It's like Express in the context of Node. Then you see the language support that you have over here on the side. OK, so that means I could go and say .NET new console. It goes in it makes one. I have suddenly some stuff. The stuff part is a little confusing. Because this is a compiled and strongly typed language, you'll see some binary folders and some files that get created for you. Uh, you can usually delete those. They have caches and project stuff. So I could delete that folder and still run it again because the next time I build those artifacts, those temporary artifacts will be uh, created. Languages like Go and other languages might hide that stuff in the temp folder. That's basically where it is. It's sitting right there. Now, if I say .NET build and I run it again, now I've got a binaries folder where my, my thing is output. So I can go down there and I can see my application and there it is. There's my super fancy application. Again, there's the executable and a dynamic link library. Those are the things that you need. Your portable debug file. And then some JSON things for development and runtime configuration. Those can largely be ignored as well, because now I can just go and say super fancy exe and it runs. Okay? And then you can run it at scale. Now I'm running it at scale. That's .NET in a nutshell. In this case here, though, the runtime, the shared runtime, the thing that makes .NET work, is installed on this machine. And you'll notice that I'm saying .NET this and .NET that. I can say .NET info to find out the versions of .NET that I have. I can find out about my runtime environment and where these things are located. Now, if I switch over on my same machine to Ubuntu or a Linux machine, or maybe you're on a Mac, I can say .NET dash dash info, and I can see here it's installed somewhere else. And I have fewer .NETs. I just have this one runtime and this one SDK install. And I could go and do the same stuff. Again, it runs everywhere. Over on my main development machine, you see I have different versions. That's important because you can run your applications side by side, meaning that if I want to use this version or that version, one .NET app can't break another just because you have different versions. Okay? Now let's switch over to... Now let's switch over to something that's actually an app. Here's C Sharp. Now this is kind of classic, or what they call idiomatic C-sharp, where we just have a Fibonacci sequence. And we're saying that we're going to use one of those base class libraries that comes in. This is a, a thing that allows me to say console.writeline. I could just say system.console.writeline, and now I can get rid of that. It's just a namespace scoper. Here I'm saying that the namespace for my application is C-sharp fib. I can be whatever. It doesn't matter. That's going to become now the namespace for my class here, which I just called program. Also not a big deal. My static void main, my entry point to my application right here called main. You might see that in other C type languages, C and C++. Um, Java have this idea of a main. And then we go and we call a function called fib, which we created up here. Takes in an integer. Says, hey, if that i is less than or equal to 2, we'll return 1. 
otherwise we'll go and we'll call ourselves we'll do a recursive call and we'll do the Fibonacci sequence now again we've got that obj folder that's full of stuff that I can delete and it'll get recreated when I recompile got that bin folder with the resulting application these things can all be deleted so for example I can go and just torch that torch that Okay, now from within my Visual Studio code here, I'm just going to open up the terminal and I'll say .NET run, which is going to build it and run it. And you'll notice on the left hand side, those two vestigial artifacts files just came back. I did a run and there's the value there, 67, 65, the Fibonacci of 20. One of the things that people find confusing about .NET is it has a project file. You see this C sharp Garage. Some languages are folder based where you just put stuff in a folder and then it works. But uh, C Sharp is really welcome in the enterprises and a lot of people use it on really big systems. And sometimes that system breaks down and you have this project file which has settings, configuration, and then sometimes including or excluding the files that you want for your application. So there's important things happening in here like the kind of thing that we're outputting. Are we outputting a library? Are we outputting an executable? Which framework are we using? Uh, the SDK that we're using here. I could use a web SDK or a regular SDK. But one of the things that I thought might be kind of cool to show you is again, because .NET is an ecosystem, uh, there's a lot of subtlety going on. Remember how I said that there's the runtime, but there's also the language. The languages themselves have versions. So for example, C Sharp 9 is being worked on right now. So that's different. I could go in here and I could say, you know, let's do the Fibonacci sequence, except I want to try a different version of the language. I want to try one of the preview versions of our language. So I'm going to try a preview of C Sharp 9. All right, we'll go in here. Okay, see if it still runs. We'll just run out at the command line here and we'll make sure it still runs. I want to go back up to my desktop and down into the C Sharp folder. I could do all of this in Visual Studio, but I thought it'd be nice for you to actually see someone drive a stick shift rather than drive an automatic. We see that I changed the language and nothing changed, right? So nothing's really interesting there, but there are some things about C Sharp that people not, might not like. For example, they might not want to do that, or they might not want the namespace. They might find classes frustrating or annoying for uh, basic applications. They might find that entry point to be somewhat uh, frustrating. So they may not necessarily want these things. They may just want to have something like this. So here I've got a top level program and all those things that were around us, the using statement, the entry point, that's all implied. This looks a little bit more like a, uh, a Python application where you just say, hey, well, oh, print screen, let's do it, right? So here we're doing a pretty simple if statement and then a return. If I wanted to, I could do something like this. Right, as we see, or if you like your KNRC, you could do it like that. That's cool. You know, everyone's different. But with C Sharp uh, 9, you could do, because this is effectively a matching statement, you could do things a little differently, right? Maybe then rather than doing it like this, I might want to basically get rid of this whole function here and we'll say, make it as a, a lambda. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to switch on that I that's coming in. All right. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pull this in here and I'm going to say that integer when I is less than two, then that right goes to one. Okay. And then down here, everything else, kind of the else statement is going to go to fib ourselves. Cool. All right. So that's a very different looking application here. This is C sharp nine. So it's a living language. It's changing. It's uh, optional. You saw, of course, that I was able to run things either way. It just depends on how you want things to look. Let's go and see if that still runs. And it does. Now you note that that took a moment, one, 1,000, two, 1,000. That's because run implies a build. It's a statically typed language. So that's important. And it implies a run. But if I went down there and I ran it directly, that runs just fine. So, so here is our C sharp nine version of fib. If we put it back the way it was, we just control Z our way to glory. That's your idiomatic way of doing things in C sharp. You get a lot of flexibility there, a lot of choices. Remember how I said that this was in fact a, uh, 
a series of languages. You could also do things like this. So this is F sharp. This is our functional OCaml style language here. Also .NET can also use all the libraries in the ecosystem, can also run in all those different places. It's just doing things in a functional way. And you'll notice that that C Sharp 9 with its pattern matching introduced some interesting functional styles as well. So these different languages kind of feed off each other and you'll see them uh, taking features back and forth because it's all part of the same .NET family. So here's a cool and interesting way to go and do that let, declare that that's the case, and then call this fib function. And I could theoretically call C Sharp and other things from F Sharp and vice versa because it's just .NET. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but all of that turns into an intermediate language and then gets run through that common language runtime, which then again runs anywhere. So that is F Sharp. All of this is part of that .NET ecosystem. All right? reminding ourselves of what's going on here. When we say .NET, it's the product, it's the ecosystem, it's the download, you could call it that. But you've got all these languages, you've got runtimes that can run anywhere, you've got tons of libraries that you can bring in, then of course your common language runtime, different languages, living languages, languages that have version numbers. NuGet is our package manager, you can go to NuGet.org and you can see all the different packages, about 57 billion downloads. You can go up there and explore the different open source packages that have been downloaded. The runtime's open source, the docs themselves are open source, all the libraries, compilers, everything is pretty cool. So if we go back to our friends who have just uh, stumbled into .NET, they really are finding a mini operating system. You've got support for basically executing anywhere, lots of different programming languages, and I'm glad that you have questions because we are a, a welcoming community and we're here to help you. Uh, there's a lot of fun stuff you can do. I'm just doing Fibonacci right here. But the fun part, of course, is that if I wanted to do something even more, like, for example, my podcast, which is a whole web application that runs in Docker and runs on Linux, I can go here and I can say .NET Run. I'm going to go and compile my podcast website locally here, pop it up on localhost. I'll then jump over and I'll say localhost 5000, 5001. We'll see if we can bring up my podcast for a second. Boom, there we go. And now I'm running my application. Now, if you go to my website for my podcast, which is called Hansel Minutes, I think you should check it out. It's a lovely show. You can see right here that it was powered by .NET Core 3.1, and I've even got the git commit and the build uh, listed down there at the bottom. So I can make websites, I can make mobile apps, games, all kinds of stuff. So that's my short, how long was this? Less than 20 minute explanation of what .NET is. It's a, a really lovely world of libraries, languages, runtimes. Uh, it might take a moment. Looks like it's gonna take you 20 minutes to get a sense of what's going on. I would encourage you to take a look at dot.net slash videos slash videos. We have a whole series of videos here for you to check out. C Sharp 101, it's a 19 part series, just short little bite-sized videos. See Leslie here talking about ASP.NET Core, uh, Sweeky talking about using it on a Raspberry Pi, making desktop apps, containers. We've got a whole bunch of great folks talking about all of this stuff. And if you don't want to install anything, we've even got a no install version of .NET. You just play with it in the browser and try it out have to install anything. It's super cool. So that's .NET in uh, just a few minutes. Check it out.